Allah Ta'ala received his uh, forgiveness and his refuge from our uh, evil deeds. And we bear witnesses that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his prophet and messenger. Uh, welcome back to the Islamic Week uh, Talks. Today talks is uh, Jesus and Prophets of Islam with uh, Sheikh uh, Shadir Ali from Canada. Uh, I think that you know his profile.
Uh, chapter 3 of the Quran is known as uh, Surah Al-Imran, the chapter of the family of, of Imran. Imran here is given as the uh, father of Mary, and hence the grandfather of Jesus. That chapter is so named because uh, the story begins actually with the birth of Mary, and uh, prior to her birth, the fact that her mother wanted to dedicate whatever child was in her womb to the temple, and she made that pledge to God before the birth of this child. To her surprise, it was uh, Mary, a girl, and instead of a boy that would be expected if one wanted to, to serve the temple. Uh, to serve at the temple. Uh, so, uh, chapter 3 and chapter 19 both are named in such a way that uh, all already, uh, immediately before one reads the chapter, uh, brings to mind what the subject matter is about and the importance of, of Jesus in, in the Quranic teaching. Uh, the Quran doesn't have anything negative to say about Jesus. There's no place in the Quran where something is said with the intention to demean Jesus, to bring down his status, or, or to lower him in any way. Uh, from the Quranic perspective, of course, Jesus was a human being, and that uh, for Christians, uh, or for some Christians, those who accept Jesus as, uh, as God, uh, that would immediately be a way of demeaning Jesus. But uh, obviously this was not intended from the Quranic perspective. There is only one God, there is a strict monotheism, uh, and uh, all of everyone else other than God are, are God's creatures. And uh, it's starting with that in mind, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, on whom we peace, who is the key figure in the formation of the religion of Islam as we now know it, uh, he is continually referred to as a human being, and uh, one passage of the Quran said, has him say, I am only a human being like you. You It has been revealed to me that your God is one God. Uh, so that the, the difference here in, in his case is that he has received a special revelation. But other than that, as a human being, he's just like the rest of us. He is a mortal. So the Quran is never tired of uh, him emphasizing that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a human being. Uh, no Muslim sees that as in any way demeaning the status uh, or the position of the Prophet Muhammad. He's just telling it like he is. He's a human being. And uh, in the Islamic faith, we are to strictly distinguish between God and his creatures. So in that context, uh, we can see that whatever else is said about Jesus actually raises his status above the status of uh, ordinary human beings because now Jesus is conferred, uh, uh, specific titles are conferred upon Jesus. For example, the Prophet, that's a, a noble title in the Islamic faith, because that means that a certain individual has been singled out by God to be a spokesman for God. He's uh, given the title of Rasul, which means messenger, and that uh, in Muslim theology is a special sort of prophet. It is a prophet uh, who has the, a, a special revelation given to him so that he can deliver that. He has a message to deliver as opposed to ordinary prophets who may simply follow on from the teachings of prophets before him. Jesus is referred to in Surah 3 as Al-Masih, the Messiah. And this is uh, a, a term that is uh, made much of in the New Testament. Christians believe that Jesus is a, a unique sort of person who has been given a special office uh, by God that office is referred to as uh, messiahship. He is the messiah. But we'll have occasion to explain in some more detail, especially in response to your questions, what that means. But nevertheless, here, a very significant title um, in, in Christianity is uh, given to Jesus in the Quranic text. Miracles are said to be the things that uh, uh, propel uh, many to think of Jesus as being God, because the argument goes, if Jesus performed all of these miracles, then he must be God, he couldn't have been an ordinary human being. And yet the Quran is not shy of uh, delineating the miracles of Jesus. In, in Surah 3, for example, we have it that Jesus uh, was able to heal the blind, cure the leper, raise the dead. Uh, and one might say, okay, well that means he's God. But from the Quran perspective, he does all of these things with the will and permission of God. It's not his own power that causes him to do this, but he does that by God's permission. But having said all of this, uh, it, it is clear from the Quran that uh, Jesus is, as I've said, a human being. And our Christian friends will say to us, well, if you do not accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, well then you don't really believe in him. 
So we should try then to understand how, how did the idea come about that Jesus is uh, someone's Lord and, and personal Savior. So to, to do that, I want to remind you of something that I covered previously. Uh, but it, it is so central to much of what I say that uh, I, I feel it would be worthwhile to just go over it one more time uh, to make sure that everyone understands it. Of course, I've improved, I've improved the slides a little bit to give you a better idea of what's happening. Uh, this here is uh, a chronology taken from Nelson's vital book of maps and charts, uh, which permits uh, users like myself to use the pages for, and the diagrams for educational purposes. So we have the birth of Jesus during the reign of King Herod the Great, uh, somewhere around 4 BC, because Herod dies in 4 BC, so Jesus must have been born somewhere uh, just prior to that. And then it is said that he was crucified uh, approximately AD 30. Nowadays we don't say AD anymore. I don't know why this book has returned this language, because it's more custom customary now to say CE, the common era. Uh, but I, I suppose this is a Christian book, so, so naturally they use that uh, language. But the more inclusive language is CE, common era. Uh, and then the book of Revelation, which is the last of the, of the books in the Bible, the very last book is called the book of Revelation or Apocalypse in some other translations. That is said to be written around the year 100. So you can see that uh, between the, the Jesus leaving the scene and the books of the Bible being written, you have this long period several uh, decades uh, passing. Uh, some scholars think that uh, some books of the Bible are actually written after Revelation. Most notable in this regard is the second uh, letter of Peter, which is thought to be written by someone else. But that's a little bit besides the point. Uh, the important thing is for you to understand that there is a gap between Jesus uh, leaving the scene and the documents that describe him being written. But let's look at the, uh, the primary documents. Uh, I've already said earlier today that the New Testament is made up of 27 smaller books. Uh, some of them may be, just be short letters, but they're called books for our purposes here. There are 27 such uh, documents, larger treatises or, uh, or, or letters. Uh, among those 27 books, there are the four Gospels. The Gospel according to Matthew, uh, that's not short for Matt Damon, huh? that's Matthew. Uh, <laughs> The Gospel according to Matthew, Gospel according to Mark, Gospel according to Luke, Gospel according to John. Obviously, I didn't hear some visual representations. Uh, and this only captures the fact that each Gospel was written on a scroll of a separate, uh, uh, separate parchment, if you like, and circulated in different areas, and then eventually they were compiled together, copied, and put into the single, single binding that we have now. So somebody who was uh, reading Matthew at Antioch I didn't know Mark because that was circulating at Rome or in Rome. Uh, Luke, again, traditionally was said to be written at Ephesus, uh, sorry, at Caesarea, and John was said to be written at a place called Ephesus. Each gospel, according to Christian tradition, was written in a different place and obviously initially circulated in that different place until eventually they were collected all together. So readers of one didn't know what's in the other. The, the writers sometimes knew because as we will come to see they borrowed from from each other. So as scholars, they obviously did their research and they knew what others were writing, but the common folk just knew of one gospel each. When the Christian uh, scholars tried to compile the books that were commonly being read in various parts of the Christian empire, then of course they found that these were the most popular gospels, and uh, one could not omit or, or exclude any of these without uh, causing some dissatisfaction in some circles where these Gospels were already in favorites, and so they were all compiled together. Um, otherwise, one might think that uh, one hardly needs the Gospel according to Mark, for example. But we'll see why that is the case. Now, uh, traditionally, um, I, I should, let me go on one step further. I, I'm missing one slide here, which I may have uh, uh, omitted. Okay, here it is. Okay, so the, the order as they appear in the Gospels now, it is, it's Matthew first and John last, and Mark and Luke in between. This is how they, they appear now in the, in the Christian Bible. But uh, what scholars have uh, long recognized is that there is a need to revise that order. It's not that, that Matthew was first and Mark was second. It's Mark needs to be in position number one. Uh, and, and so that leads us to the, uh, the common hypothesis now, 
that Mark was written first and John was written last. So that, I believe, is an important point for people to understand, especially when Muslims get into conversations uh, with others. If you follow many of the Muslim Christian debates from Sheikh Ahmad Idat and others uh, over, over the last couple of decades, you will find that often a Muslim might be quoting something to show that Jesus is a human being, and, and the Christian uh, debater might be quoting something to show that he is really divine. And often what will happen is that the Christian will be quoting from this last of the four Gospels, the Gospel according to John. For example, a Christian might uh, cite Jesus as saying before uh, Abraham was I am. Where do you think that comes from? That's John chapter 8, verse 58. Or whoever has seen me has seen the Father, John chapter 14, verse 9 perhaps. Uh, I and the Father are one, John chapter 10, verse 30. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John chapter 1, verse 29 perhaps. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Where does that come from? John chapter 3, verse 16. So, uh, all of the, the sayings, or most of the sayings, that will immediately be cited uh, as uh, a, a proof that Jesus is God, seems to come from the Gospel according to John. Now that's a significant point. Because if you have Gospels written over time, one is written, another one is written, a third is written, and then a fourth is eventually written, well, and as the decades pass, then you would expect that, of course, not all, each Gospel cannot be expected to record every event in the life of Jesus. But in some sort of summary form, you would expect that each one of the Gospels would report the most important thing about Jesus. And if he was God, then I can't see that anything is more important than this to mention. And of course, the, the proofs that he is God, or mentioned that he is God, uh, should be prominent in all of the Gospels. Uh, on the contrary, what we find is that uh, it's in the Gospel according to John, the last of the four to be written, that we have this kind of repeated mention of something that shows Jesus to be uh, on a slightly higher plane. Uh, I don't believe that the Gospel according to John uh, unequivocally uh, shows that Jesus is God. Uh, it seems to me that the Gospel according to John places Jesus on a position between man and God. Uh, but, but we'll discuss the details of that later. But by placing Jesus in that position, the Gospel according to John is different from the, from the other Gospels. So once you, once you recognize this, all, all you have to remember is Mark is first and, and, and John is last. If you, if you recognize that, then, then you can understand what Muslims and Christians have been quarreling about. You understand what these debates are, are, are about and how they're debating. Why is it that the Muslim seems to be quoting one thing and the Christian seems to be quoting another thing and they can't get their thoughts together? The Muslim is saying, look, Jesus is a man because look at this, this, and that passage. He might be citing Mark, he might be citing Matthew, he might be citing Luke, and, and on occasion even citing John. Because John, despite its uh, its leaning towards uh, placing Jesus on a higher level, and nevertheless includes some material about Jesus, which also shows that he was a human being. The idea that Jesus was a human being and having limitations and so on is uh, throughout, because that was such an undeniable fact about him. Uh, but John's Gospel has had another layer of, layer of tradition and another uh, theme running throughout his emotive, the idea that Jesus is somehow divine. So, so both are combined in the Gospel according to John. But in the other Gospels, there is very little that will uh, commend Jesus uh, as being of that level where, where John leaves him. So remember that Mark is first and John is last, and you uh, quite are ahead in terms of understanding uh, the, the debates. Now, to continue then, Scholars have tried to look at the literary relationship between the three Gospels, which are so different from John. John is the different Gospel we've already seen, right? John, different. Because John places Jesus on a higher level. Other reasons besides. Uh, more importantly, scholars have noted that the events that are related in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are in fact similar from one Gospel to another such that you can, out, uh, you can line up the Gospels in three parallel columns and you can see them together. Mark, I'm sorry, Matthew, the way they have done it traditionally, Matthew, Mark, Luke. 
And you can see that this free actually, actually from where you're looking it will be Matthew, Mark, Luke. Okay, it'll be this way, yeah? So Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you, you can you can line them up this way and see one episode after another, Jesus goes there, he goes the same place, he goes the same place. So the same event in the three gospels. You can compare the wording across and see that, that you're basically dealing with the same event with some slight modification, a different way of narrating the same thing among the three Gospels. So scholars noted that there is a literary relationship between the, the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, uh, and Luke, and moreover, they began to discover that Mark, or something close to Mark, as I said earlier, or Marcus, but for our purposes, just we can just say simply, Mark was the source of Matthew and Luke. Luke and Matthew, therefore, just simply copied Mark, but again, not, not simply. That they copied Mark, but with modifications. Once we realize that too, uh, we, we have a way of reading the Gospels and seeing how the stories about Jesus have been modified, how have been changed over time. Let me see what my next slides bring. Okay, uh, see, I've got my slides here a reverse. I should have shown you this first, and, and, and then that. Anyway, the dating of the Gospels. <coughs> Scholars generally say that Mark was written around 70 CD, Matthew, around, Matthew and Luke around 85, and John around the year 100. Now, if we remember where we started off with the chronology from Nelson's Bible Book of Maps and Charts, uh, here we have it that Jesus left the scene around 8030, and Revelation written around 8100. So we have the Gospels written in this period. So from 30, when Jesus leaves the scene, uh, to about 70. Nelson's book of Bible maps and charts would probably not agree with these dates. They would probably give some earlier dates from Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John. But these dates are generally agreed on uh, by, by most biblical scholars. If one were to look, for example, at Raymond Brown's introduction to the New Testament, uh, these are roughly the dates that one would find him uh, uh, assigning to the various Gospels. So you can see that over a period of time, the stories are being told and retold. Now, I said that when we compare the Gospels, we can see how uh, the story gets changed from one gospel to another. And this is where I, I, I will be uh, talking about one of the troublesome issues uh, that Muslims have found as they try to uh, speak about Jesus in, in the Quran. Mark has it that after Jesus had been crucified and, and, and died, after he died, his body was placed in a tomb and, and a rock was rolled against the mouth of the tomb. That occurred on a Friday. And then, on the Sunday morning following that, some of his female disciples went to the tomb, and they found that the tomb was empty. And a young man, in, in dazzling white, uh, said to them that Jesus is not there, he is risen. Look at the place where he is uh, laid, and, well, where he had been laid. And then, uh, the women fled from the tomb with trembling and astonishment, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The earliest manuscripts of Mark's Gospel that we have today ends at that point. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So then how did the story get written? So that, that immediately strikes one as a problem. Well, what do Matthew and, and Luke do with that as a problem? Well, Luke has it that uh, when the women went to the tomb and they met this young man, actually there were two of them, and there were more than young men, there were angels. And the angels told them the whole story about Jesus being raised from the dead. Um, if I didn't mention that in, in the case of Mark, I should have, because Mark also says he has risen. Uh, the, the young man tells the women that Jesus has risen. Uh, Luke's Gospel also has it. The, the angels tell the women that Jesus has risen. Uh, from the dead, or has been raised from the dead, and uh, in fact they should know this because he already had told them the same thing would happen while he was with them in Galilee. So the women understood the whole story now, and uh, they simply left the tomb and went to tell the disciples. And when returning from the tomb, Luke says, they told this to the disciples and all the rest. So here there's no fear and astonishment, and there's no silence. 
See, the silence there was the problem. And even the, the leaving on a note of fear is a, is a problem too. If they feared initially because they're seeing something supernatural and they don't understand what it is, why should they continue to fear even though they know that these were angels? that spoke with them, or this was an angel that spoke to them. So the fear, and the, especially the silence, becomes your problem, but that is overcome in Luke, because Luke says they understood the whole story, and they went and told this to all the rest. So now the story can be written, right? Okay, so how does Matthew deal with the same problem? Matthew has it that the women have fled from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to tell the disciples. So here, there was fear. Here, there is fear and great joy. The one thing which was missing from Mark was the great joy. You might expect, okay, the women go to the tomb and they find out that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Hallelujah! Right? Praise God! There should be great joy. But, but there's none of that in, in Mark. So now we have it in Matthew. So uh, we can see that the story is given in Matthew in, as a new and improved version. What we want in the story is finally there. Not only... And Matthew retains the wording from Mark to a large extent. So Mark says they return, they, they left with fear. Matthew faithfully puts it. They left with fear. But he adds, and great joy. And then what was the problem here? Mark has it that the women were silent. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now Matthew has it that they ran to tell the disciples. So you see how the story gets to be improved over time. I've already remarked that uh, Mark's Gospel is, uh, again, the earliest copies we have of it today ends with Mark chapter 16, verse number 8. I didn't give you the verse number, but I give it to you now. Where it says that the women fled from the tomb and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The verse before that, verse number 7, is the verse that has the angel telling, or this young man in dazzling white, telling the women that Jesus is going to appear to his disciples in Galilee. So the disciples are to go to Galilee and there they will see Jesus. I wish I had a map to show you the, the locations, but uh, uh, that should not be necessary. This uh, circumstance is now Jerusalem and uh, Jesus is from Galilee and that's where the disciples are told to go back, uh, where they're also from, and there they will eventually see Jesus. So now, Galilee is about some 80 kilometers to the north of, uh, of Jerusalem. This passage in Mark, Mark chapter 16, verse 7, which says that they are to go to Galilee and there they will see Jesus, this according to many biblical scholars such as Wolfhard Pattenberg, uh, is absent from Mark's own source. So we have it just as Matthew and Luke are copying from Mark. Mark also is copying from some other source, which we don't have today. But scholars have tried to reconstruct it, and they refer to it at least with the reference to the, the passion, the, the story about the suffering of Jesus. They refer to it as the passion narrative, the pre-Martin passion narrative. And they say that that pre-Martin passion narrative did not have the part about Jesus appearing to his disciples again after he had now come out of the tomb. That makes to me a tremendous amount of difference. But what difference does it make? That difference is spelled out in great detail in, in a book by Daniel Smith, which is the result of his PhD thesis, a book entitled The Postmortem Vindication of Jesus in the Saints Gospel Q. He's referring to another gospel which scholars hypothesize once exists, but once existed, but we should not uh, worry about the, the fact of Q or the question about Q for the moment. Just think about uh, where this is going. According to Daniel Smith, uh, the, the, an earlier proclamation about Jesus was that Jesus was taken directly from the tomb and straight into heaven. So uh, that in, in the history of Christian ideas would be referred to as assumption. The assumption of Jesus. He ascends. He raises, or he is raised from the tomb straight into heaven, and that's it. Whereas the Christian Gospels now, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them have what we call the resurrection from the dead as a two part event. First, Jesus wakes up from his death, he comes out of the tomb, 
he meets his disciples, and then eventually he's taken up into heaven. So there's a two-part event. First he comes back to life, and of course he meets his disciples, and then finally he's raised up to heaven. Two parts. Whereas in Assumption, there's only a one singular event. He's just taken up straight into heaven. The difference is significant in that in the Quran, there is only a mention of a one-part event. In the Quran, what it simply says is, But God raised him to himself. It's not two part, but he comes out of the tomb, he meets his disciples, and then eventually he's taken up. Let, let me continue. Uh, I, I said that we shouldn't worry too much about Daniel Smith uh, basing this on, on the Q Gospel, because for our purposes here, it is enough for us to focus on Mark's Gospel. Because Daniel Smith uh, shows that by, our, by, by, in, by comparison with uh, what he has already, his whole study was based on, Q's, on, on the Gospel of Q, but he's saying that by comparison we find the same underlying feature in the pre and Passion narrative. Because again, uh, like Wolfgang Kahnenberg, he doesn't think that uh, John chapter, uh, Mark chapter 16 verse 7 is, uh, was a part of the pre and Passion narrative. And in that case, the pre and Passion narrative didn't say anything about Jesus coming back to appear to his disciples. And that means we have what he calls a typical assumption story. He has shown that uh, in, in, in that period, there are many literary works which have assumption uh, as one of the, uh, as the usual end of the life of a hero. The hero dies, he is buried, a lover comes to visit the tomb, and finds that the tomb is empty. And the conclusion is that this hero has been translated into heaven. Now even though John's Gospel is the last of the four to be written, uh, and we've already shown how John's Gospel has de de developed features, uh, many scholars think that the opening of John chapter 20 has the earlier form of the story of the women coming to the tomb. Remember we've already said that in these three Gospels we have the women coming to the tomb and they meet an angel uh, who talks to them. An angel. Uh, in Mark it's a young man in dazzling white. In Matthew it is an angel. In Luke it's two angels. And, and they, know, they understand everything that has occurred. But in John's Gospel, the first visit of Mary Magdalene to the tomb is one in which she doesn't meet anyone, she returns not knowing what has happened. She goes back to the disciples and says, uh, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. So that's a typical assumption story. The lover goes to the tomb, uh, finds the tomb to be empty, and eventually the conclusion is that the hero has been taken away from the tomb, translated straight into heaven, taken taken by God, obviously. So, uh, the, an earlier proclamation, before people began speaking about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, according to this research, is that people spoke about the assumption of Jesus from his grave all the way up into, into heaven. More than this, a German scholar, Dieter Zeller, uh, whose work I didn't read directly, but I read of him in, in the same book I just cited by Daniel Smith, that holds that the Q Gospel, and, and I should now tell you some more, something more about the Q Gospel. Uh, scholars believe that in addition to, let me see if I can get a page where, let me see here if I can get a page where I have more space to write something about the Q Gospels. Mm, about the Q Gospel, maybe right here. Yeah, this is a good enough place. Scholars think that in addition to uh, uh, Mark, which was used by Matthew and Luke, there was another gospel, which they referred to as the Q gospel. And, and that gospel, they call Q because they don't know the name of it. Q is short for Quella, which means source. The scholars think that Matthew and, and Luke borrowed the basic outline from Mark. Outline of events are found in Matthew and Luke, borrowed from here. But Matthew and Luke has a, a large number of sayings of Jesus, some 300 verses. 
245 perhaps, are found in Matthew and Luke, which are not in Mark. And scholars believe that those were derived from another gospel, which we don't have in existence today, except as parts of it are found in Matthew and Luke. That gospel they refer to as Quella, which means source in German, and just simply Q for short. Now, the Q gospel, uh, according to Dieter Zeller, does not mention the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that's a curious point about Q. Because the idea of the death and resurrection has become such a central point of Christianity. Paul, in, in one of his letters, in his letter to the Corinthians, uh, chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, emphasizes the resurrection of Jesus and says that if Jesus has not been raised, then your faith is vain and you are still in your sins. So it seems that nothing else matters unless Jesus is raised from the dead. That's the most important teaching now in, in Pauline Christianity. So why is that missing from the Q Gospel? Dieter Zeller thinks it is because the earlier idea, before these Gospels were written, was that Jesus was assumed into heaven, again, translated into heaven, but he thinks that Jesus was translated into heaven alive, not dead. And he, he draws this conclusion because in the Q Gospel, there is a saying about the sign of Jonah. Jesus gives the sign of Jonah in the Q Gospel. That something about Jesus will resemble something about Jonah. And what was that something? Now in the story of Jonah, of Yunus Islam in the Bible, Jonah is swallowed up by a huge fish or by a whale. Some translations uh, seem to have it both ways, but you can't have it both ways because uh, it, it, no, no fish is a whale and no whale is a fish. <laughs> so, uh, but that's not a problem in the Bible itself, that's a problem in the translations. In any case, Jonah is swallowed up by a whale and after uh, three days he is coughed up on shore. So what was the condition of Jonah in the belly of the whale? <coughs> He was alive. What was the condition of Jesus when he was in, placed in the tomb? If we look for the comparison, the obvious comparison is that he might have been alive. Matthew's Gospel expands upon that uh, sign of Jonah that says, As Jonah was three days in, in, and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, as Jonah was, so shall the Son of Man be. How was Jonah? He was alive. How was the Son of Man? Probably was alive. Uh, what else might, might lead to the um, supposition that Jesus might have been alive? It is clear that these four Gospels are all written to try and convince us that Jesus actually died on the cross. That's their whole point. But beneath what they're saying, one can see some indications that another reality might have been the case. Consider, for example, that crucifixion does not pierce any vital organ of a person. Usually a person hangs for a few days, and it was meant to be one of the most uh, torturous uh, deaths. And, and the idea was to keep him hanging for a few days, so he serves as a warning to others, all passing by the crossroads. And, uh, and he just agonizes until finally he dies due to exhaustion, and shock that follows from that. <clears throat> One thing might have killed Jesus quickly. That was the spear of thrust that is mentioned in John's Gospel. John's Gospel mentions that one of the Roman soldiers came and pierced the side of Jesus with the spear. So if that, if that wound was uh, fatal, well then that would have obviously been the thing that uh, would have been the thing that killed Jesus. But most uh, biblical scholars today do not regard that spear for us as historically correct or accurate. They think that John's Gospel introduced that spear for us for the very point of trying to prove that Jesus died. Because people are reading Mark's Gospel, they're reading Matthew's Gospel, they're reading Luke's Gospel, and they're wondering, how did Jesus die? Because according to the Gospels, he hung on the cross only for a few hours. Mark's, Mark's Gospel has it that Jesus was put on the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning, and then at 3 o'clock he breathed his last. So
So why did he die in just six hours? Whereas by comparison, a, a, a Jewish historian from the period, Josephus, says that he himself, on one occasion, was coming back from a place called Tekoa. As he approached Jerusalem, he found that three of his friends were, hung, were hanging on crosses. They were being crucified. And he used his influence to have them taken down and given medical attention. Two of them died anyhow, but one of them survived. Which means that when he came back, and as he said, they were hanging on the crosses for three days. So three days later, the three were still alive, and two of them eventually succumbed to uh, the, the, uh, the suffering, but one of them nevertheless survived. So generally, it took a few days to kill a person by crucifixion. How did Jesus die in just a few hours? This pair of thrust might have done it, but that is mentioned only in the last of the four Gospels, and scholars believe that John inserted that for his own apologetic purposes, for his own purposes of trying to prove to us that he finally died, and that this uh, is not uh, a, a truth in fact. So in that case, we are left with the puzzle, how did Jesus die? Mark's Gospel says that when, uh, when Jesus apparently breathed his last, because he let off his loud cry, and then he apparently breathed his last, everyone could see he is expired. One of his secret disciples, Joseph of Arimathea, went to Pilate, the Roman governor, to seek permission to have Jesus' body taken down and given a burial. And Pilate was amazed that Jesus died so soon. And then he asked the centurion, who was the head of a hundred in the army, and the centurion confirmed that Jesus was dead. And then Pilate granted the request. That idea that Pilate was amazed now becomes a question in the mind of, a re of the reader. The reader might be saying, yeah, how did he die? Did he really die so soon? As Pilate is amazed, the reader becomes amazed as well. And uh, Matthew and Luke omitted the mention that Pilate was amazed. Raymond Brown, in his magisterial work, uh, The Death of the Messiah, in two volumes, uh, says that Matthew and Luke omitted the mention that Pilate was amazed because they do not want their readers to ask the same question which readers of Mark's Gospel are asking. Because readers of Mark's Gospel are asking, yeah, how did he die? Did he read die so soon? Matthew and Luke just simply omit the mention of that, according to Raymond Brown. So in, in short, it, it seems that the earlier proclamation about Jesus was that he didn't die on the cross, and that he was assumed into heaven, translated into heaven. Which means that the stories which are mentioned in the Gospels are now suspect. The stories which say that he came out of his tomb, he met his disciples for a period of time, and then finally he was ascended into heaven. Muslims and Christians agree that Jesus ascended into heaven, but the question is when and how. When did he ascend into heaven? And in what condition? Was he alive or was he dead? Now, to move on, in fact, uh, Muslim scholars themselves uh, are, are not quite agreed on all of the details. Here's an English translation from uh, Surah 4, uh, starting with verse number 155, but just to give you the context, they also incurred divine displeasure when they did all of these things, and finally, they rejected faith, and they said, in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, that is Al Masih Isa ibn Maryam, they killed Christ, they say, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of God. Obviously, you don't believe him to be the Messiah and the messenger of God, but they're saying this uh, in, in score. You know, this one who claimed to be the Messiah, uh, the, the messenger of God, we killed him. Um, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts, with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow, for of a surety they kill him not. You can see where the conclusion is, they kill him not. And no, God raised him up unto himself, and Allah is exalted in power, um, wise. So, وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلْنَا الْمَسِيحَ عَيْسَ بْنَ مَرِيمَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا فَلَوُهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَا لَهُمْ وَإِنَا لَذِينَ قَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكِّ مِنْ they are only following a conjecture. 
But they did not kill him for certain. But God raised him to himself. So that's the Quranic text. What does it mean to say, This seems to refer to two separate actions. They killed him not, nor did they crucify him. But of course, there is some overlap because if they didn't, if, if suppose some, you see, killing and crucifying are, are two terms which have some overlapping meaning. Because if a person is crucified, then he's killed, but in a specific way. There's an overlap in the meaning. Sometimes words have this kind of overlapping meaning, but when they're used in juxtaposition with each other, they have a more specific meaning. The intersecting part of the meaning is now cancelled because each has its own meaning complementing the other. The two terms, Qatl and Sal, are used in a similar juxtaposition in Surah Al-Ma'idah in Ayah number 33. Look it up uh, sometime. Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ayah number 33. There it talks about uh, the penalty for the Muharibin. What is their penalty? Ayu <coughs> Qatlu, Ayu Salabu that they should be killed or crucified. So what does crucified mean in that place? It means they should be killed in that specific way of crucifixion. So either they should be killed by some ordinary means, or they should be killed by the means of crucifixion. So here, we have the denial of the two terms. Which seems to mean, if we follow from the, the Jaza'ul Maharibi, uh, is that they, uh, they, they, they either killed him by some ordinary means, they didn't kill him by some ordinary means, or they did not kill him by the specific means of crucifixion. The obvious goal of crucifixion is that they should have him dead. The word crucify could have two basic meanings. I'd like you to think of the two meanings. Remember we said that Mark has it that we said that Mark has it that Jesus was crucified by 9 o'clock in the morning and then he died by 3 in the afternoon. So when we say he was crucified by 9 in the morning, that means simply that he was hung on the cross, right? That's one meaning, just simply hung on the cross. So Muslim scholars were very familiar with that meaning and that's the meaning that they took, hung on the cross. So when they talked about the one who was actually crucified, they, they thought of him being killed by stoning. Rajamuhu. They, they first killed him by stoning. Then they put him on the cross. Then they crucified him. So they're thinking, crucified means you just simply hang the person on the cross. Whether you hang him alive or dead, whether you hang him till he dies, or you hang him for a moment, crucified means you hang him on a cross. So, Masalabuhu means they didn't even put him on a cross. This is what... The, the classical commentators on the Quran generally uh, understood. But crucifixion has another meaning as well. It means to kill a person by the specific means of, of hanging him on a cross. Think of the Jews who opposed Jesus and wanted him dead. Think of them in front of the court of Pilate saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Now, which meaning do they have in mind? The first meaning, just hang him on a cross? Or the second meaning, hang him on a cross until he dies from that. Obviously the second one, right? So when they are saying, Inna qatalna masihabna Maryam Rasulullah, what meaning do they have in mind? The second one. We hung him on the cross until he died. But the answer to that is, ma qatalu wa ma salabu. They didn't quite crucify him in that they didn't see the job to the end. They didn't quite finish what they expected or what they wanted. They didn't fulfill the goal of, of crucifixion which was to have the man dead. Notice the wording of the Quran. Ma qatalu in response to their claim in na qatalna masihai maria. We They're saying we killed Jesus the son of Mary and the response is ma qatalu. And the Quran in response to uh, that sort of uh, objection which might arise in the mind of the reader as one goes. So, if, if the Quran is responding to them, they say, we killed him, and the Quran say, no you didn't. So they might be thinking, but wait, we crucified him. And now the Quran is responding to their, that unstated objection, 
what could have been be crucified here. That's the objection. And the Quran is responding to that and saying, no, you didn't. But the objection, when they say in their own minds, but we crucified him, they're saying, we hung him on a cross until he died. That's the real point. And the Quran is saying, no, you didn't. So uh, that's why the Quran ends by saying, uh, they didn't kill him uh, for, for certain. Now notice what else is mentioned here. But so it was made to appear to them. The classical commentators on the Quran took that to mean that someone else was changed and made to look like Jesus and that someone else was put on the cross. But in my research I found that uh, idea to be unnecessary. To begin with, there is uh, a, a, a problem, a grammatical problem with thinking of it that way because a shub usually means doubt, but it could also mean resemblance. Shabah, someone, something else, means he resembled the something else. And that's the relation between the two ideas, shub and, and, and resemblance, doubt and resemblance, is that if two things resemble each other, then you have a doubt as to which is which. Like you look at the two and you can't tell which is which, uh, it seems a little bit doubtful. So the classical commentators, instead of thinking about the doubt that is implied in Shun Bihalabon, they thought that it was made to, like someone else was made to look like Jesus and put on the cross instead. But then, look what else follows. Those who differ uh, therein are full of doubts. So it's continued, continuing the idea of Shug or Shak. So once they had taken the first part to mean that someone else was made to look like Jesus, when they came to the second part about the shack, they had to explain now what doubt remained. Because if you say that someone was made to look like Jesus, so that the arresting party took him and they put him on the cross, that means in the view of everyone, this looks like Jesus. So now, after they have put him on the cross, what doubt remains? So the Mufassirun say that the doubt that remained is that when they looked at him, they saw that the face is the face of Jesus, but the body is the body of his uh, companion. Wajuhu wajhu Isa, wa jismuhu jismu sahibih. That's what they said. That obviously what's happening here is that the commentators themselves have tied themselves into a knot and they're trying to explain now how could the shak, how could the doubt remain. But the simple thing to understand from the beginning is that when they said Shubi Halahom meant that someone else was made to look like Isa alayhi salam, they missed an important point in that Shubiha is passive. It includes the Damir Mustaqib. It's, uh, it's, it includes the hidden pronoun. It's referring back to someone. It's referring back either to he or to it. Because in Arabic you can have it both ways. A pronoun in English uh, can be either he, she, or it. And, and it, uh, it is neutral. In Arabic there is no neutral. So every, every it is either a he or a she. So in the Arabic pronoun that refers to he can also refer to it. So in this case, it's not he was made to appear to them, it's it. It was made to appear to them. It's not he, Isa alayhi salam, that was made. But the commentators took it that he, Isa alayhi salam, was made to appear. But notice the problem with that, in that it's not Isa alayhi salam who was made to resemble someone else, it's the someone else who was made to resemble him according to that view. Right? If, if, according to what the Mufassirun have said, Someone else was made to resemble Isa alayhi salam. Meanwhile, Isa alayhi salam was taken up into heaven, and the other person became the masloob. So it's the other person who was made to look like Isa alayhi salam is the masloob, who was changed. Not Isa was changed. He continued to look the way he always did. So if Shubhi Hadamun means that he was made to resemble the other one, then the he here is the masloob, the one who was actually crucified, the victim. But the victim wasn't mentioned yet. And they said in both, we killed Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, the messenger of God. But they killed him, Jesus, not. Nor crucified him, Jesus. But, but so it was made to appear to them. If you say, but he was made to resemble for them, 
as the classical commentators are saying, then that means Isa was made to resemble the other person. But as we've just seen, Isa wasn't made to resemble anyone, it's the other person who was made to resemble Isa Alayhi Salaam. Commentators said, okay, that's not a problem, we can say this is a case of taqlim wa taqlir, you know, the thing that should have been mentioned last is mentioned first, and that is acceptable in the Arabic language. Moreover, it is implied that the, it's, it's the Maslub we're talking about because now the story continues uh, regarding him. And uh, okay, that's, uh, that is an explanation, but we can see that a more, uh, a, a more sensible and reasonable overall explanation that takes into account every part of the statement and ties it in with uh, other passages of the Quran, like we mentioned the Jaza al Muharibi, right? You tie it in with that, you see where Qatl and Salt are mentioned together. Look elsewhere else in the Quran where Salt is mentioned. What does Salt mean? It means to hang a person so that he dies from the hanging. When the Fir'aun threatens the magicians, three places in the Quran this is mentioned. He says, La wasalli bannakum, I am going to crucify you. He doesn't mean he's going to hang them for a moment and then take them back down. He means that he's going to hang them until they die. Uh, the, uh, in Yusuf Alayhi Salam story, uh, and Yusuf tells one of his uh, prison mates that he is going to be crucified so that the birds will eat from his head. Uh, which means of, uh, that's what usually happens to a crucified person. The person is left there to die, and when he dies, the vultures come and they eat his flesh. So th that shows that he solved means, in this case, he, he hangs on the cross until he dies. So the denial, Masalakuhu means they did not kill him by this particular method. When we realize this then, we see how the Quranic narrative actually ties in with what we have already described. Because we have seen that scholars now, uh, in, in their detailed research, are showing that Jesus, according to Dieter Zeller, who I mentioned earlier, that a, a, an earlier view than the now prevailing Christian view, is that Jesus was taken up by God, assumed into heaven. Not that he came out of the tomb, met all of his disciples, and then was taken up into heaven. He was, the, the, from his tomb, wherever he was, he was already taken up. Moreover, Dieter Zeller has um, argued that the sign of Jonah meant that Jesus, among, among the various indications, uh, what was that the resemblance between Jesus and Jonah was that as Jonah was alive, Jesus was also alive, so that he was assumed up alive. In that case, Jesus could not be the first one to have this something like this happen to him, because the Bible speaks about Enoch. Enoch walked with God. Muslims uh, sometimes uh, say that this is uh, Idris. Idris, who is mentioned in the Quran in Surah 19. We have raised him to a high position. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God and he was no more because God took him. Obviously alive. And uh, Elijah, one of the prophets in the Bible, in the book of Kings, is said to have also been taken up alive in a whirlwind. And there was always an expectation that Elijah will come back. So when we see this now, we see that everything now makes sense. What the Quran says about the crucifixion actually uh, seems to refer to an original uh, proclamation about Jesus. And now, the doubt, the doubt that is mentioned, you saw how the Fasurun had to struggle with that. What doubt did they have if the person looked like Jesus? Where is the doubt? They said because his face looked like Jesus but his body looked like his friend. But now, Reading the Gospels, we can see that there was some real doubt as to whether Jesus died or not, because Pilate expressed that doubt. And how could that doubt be finally removed? There has to be something real that kills Jesus. And since, uh, as Raymond Brown says, crucifixion does not pierce any vital organ, we bear left wondering what really killed Jesus in just six hours, whereas crucifixion usually took a few days. Now, the Gospel according to Matthew says something interesting. So we're looking at Matthew. Matthew says that uh, the, uh, on, on the Sabbath, meaning the Saturday, so Friday Jesus is crucified and by evening he's put in the tomb. On the Saturday, the Jews went into Pilate's court, beseeching Pilate that he should put a guard on the tomb and seal the tomb, lest the disciples of Jesus should come and steal his body and then tell everyone that he is resurrected from the dead. And they say, then the second deception will be worse than the first. So what do they think is the first deception? 
What do they think is the first deception? It's not spelled out. But it seems that what they think is the first deception is that Jesus was taken down and according to Dr. William Lane Craig in his uh, article on the empty tomb, when they went away on the Friday to observe their Sabbath, they went away with the assumption that Jesus would be buried, buried like a common criminal. And the way the common criminals were buried is that they were put in a shallow grave and, uh, and done with. And if anyone would open the grave, it would be the dogs at night, and uh, they too will have their, their share. That was the whole point of crucifixion. And that's why there was such a horrible treatment for the Jews, because the Jews expected that when it comes time for the final resurrection, their bones should be put back together and then they would become whole again. So if there was nothing left, left to be buried, or if you were buried in a shallow, shallow grave and became food for the dogs, then uh, that's uh, a horrible outcome for the, for the people. And that's how the Romans kept them in check. You dare not oppose the Roman government because uh, we had to send you to Guantanamo Bay or we do something like this. And so the, the deception, according to William Lane Craig, when the Jews left, they thought that Jesus would be put in a shallow grave, but he wasn't. He was put in the tomb. So now, if he was put in a shallow grave, even if he had some breath of life in him, what would happen? He would just die. That's, not, that's the end of it. But if he's put in a tomb, in which he has enough uh, 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 carbon, uh, he has enough <laughs> oxygen, uh, then, uh, then, then obviously he, there's a possibility that he could survive. That's why the emphasis now is on sealing the tomb. So they seal the tomb, but then there is no mention if they inspected the tomb to see if the body was still there. And as Dr. William Lane Craig says, that it is possible that the body could have been missing that night, theoretically at least. Because Friday evening he's put in, you have the whole Friday night, Saturday the Jews uh, are, are, are interested in having the tomb sealed. Okay, now the tomb is sealed according to Matthew's Gospel, and the guards are placed, but they didn't look to see if the body was still in there. So theoretically, the, the tomb could have been already empty, the body could have been missing. Anyway, they sealed the tomb. But the important thing to notice here is that the Jews, who were saying that they killed Jesus, didn't have anything solid to go on. Because see how the story is. They themselves felt that they were deceived. And they said, seal the tomb, lest the second deception will be greater than the first one. They felt already that they were being deceived, they were now in doubt as to whether Jesus uh, fully and finally died. So I'll leave you with these thoughts, and uh, I'd like to uh, take your questions. I didn't quite uh, spell out in detail anything about Jesus being a Lord and Savior, but we talked about that earlier today. And I thought I should better go into this matter in some great detail for the two reasons. One is that it's a question that comes up again and again. And second, I have recently done some extensive research on this, as you can see. And I thought that it would be important for you to have this uh, information. But let me get your question.